Good evening, everyone. It is July 9th. I'm going to give you the usual COVID-19 update. We have conducted 56,687 tests in Sonoma County. Um, to date, we have 1,519 active cases cumulatively, of which, the, of which so we have 732 active, 773 recovered, and 14 fatalities. Um, unfortunately, we've experienced a number of fatalities this week. With respect to the age breakdown that we are seeing in these cases, um, in the under five category, that accounts for 3% of our cases. In the age range of five through 17 category, that accounts for 13% of our overall cases. In the 18 to 24 age range, that accounts for 12% of our cases. In the age 25 through 44 category, that is 38% of our overall cases. 45 through 54, that's 13%. In the age 55 through 64, that's 9%. In age 65 through 74, that's 5%. And then 75 and up is also 5%. Of the total world of positive COVID-19 cases, 51% are male, 49% are female. We are continuing to see this disease disproportionately impact our Latinx community. 71% of the cases have identified as Latinx, 24% have identified as white, 3% have identified as Asian or Pacific Islander, and 3% I have identified as other, including Black and Indigenous members of our community. With respect to where are we seeing this in terms of industry, the top sectors so far are services and sales at 17%. Um, we have unemployed at 13%, not working at 13%. Ag and farm work account for 12% of the total cases. Healthcare, 7%, and construction, 6%. Um, looking at the geographic distribution of our cases, we have seen the majority of our cases are still taking place in Central County, so that kind of Santa Rosa area. 55% of the cases are identified as being in Central County. 9% are in East County, 7% are in North County, 21% are in South County, and 3% in West County. 6% remain under investigation. Moving on to hospital capacity. Um, we have a total of 707 hospital beds in Sonoma County. Of those, 553 are occupied with 154 available. Um, with respect to ICU beds, there's been a fair amount of concern um, about this number as we watch, you know, sort of the, the capacity in our ICU decline. 67 ICU beds total, 65 of those are occupied, leaving two available right now. Um, with respect to reopening criteria, unfortunately, we are exceeding a number of the reopening criteria um, that we have you know, established with the state of California. Our current case rate per 100,000 over a 14-day time span is 110.7. Now, the, the threshold there is 100, so we are over that 100 threshold. The percent change in three-day average for COVID hospitalized patients, I know that's a mouthful, um, we are currently at 57% increase there and 10% is the threshold. And we are also above the threshold for the percent of ICU beds available, 20% threshold and we are at 3%. So the question becomes what happens next? I wanna walk you through very briefly before I go over to questions, um, kind of where we are with respect to, you know, looking at actions that will be taken by the state very soon. Today, we are on day three of the state's COVID-19 CDM or data monitoring project, right? As having a greater than 10% increase in the three-day average hospitalization rate for COVID positive patients. So we are then going to be moving from the um, COVID-19 data monitoring project, the CDM project at the state, into the quote unquote targeted engagement phase of the project. We will enter the targeted engagement phase of the project on Friday, July 10th. So that's tomorrow, right? Um, and at that point, the CDPH, California Department of Public Health, will work with the county's um, Department of Health Services and set up strategy calls and also provide assistance. So the next phase of the CDM project, which is the targeted engagement phase, will result in two different changes, right? Um, number one, starting tomorrow, July 10th, there will be a narrative post on the CDPH public website, which will explain the factors that contributed to the county exceeding the metric. Um, the second implication of entering phase two of the CDM project, so entering this targeted engagement phase, is that after three days of targeted engagement, the county will be required to comply with the requirements that are stated in the Governor Newsom's July 1st order. 
That means that the order will close indoor operations for certain sectors, um, those sectors in particular that promote the mixing of populations beyond households, and adherence to physical distancing and wearing facial coverings difficult. This guidance will apply to a minimum of three weeks and it is subject to an extension based on epidemiological indicators. So we're looking at a minimum of a three week closure. And so I wanna go and sort of go ahead and go over what guidance that applies to, what sectors. It applies to the following sectors. Number one, indoor dining restaurants. Number two, indoor wineries and tasting rooms. Number three, indoor family entertainment centers, indoor movie theaters, indoor zoos and museums, and indoor card rooms. Those will need to actually close down um, and cease operations for those areas. I want to be very clear that outdoor operations, um, outdoor wineries and tasting rooms will be still allowed to operate, um, as will outdoor dining opportunities. And they may also provide um, pickup services if they so desire, so the same way that we'd had before. Um, I want to be very clear, there's been a lot of confusion over whether breweries and brew pubs would be allowed um, because, you know, indoor uh, brew pubs and, and, and indoor wineries and tasting rooms are not allowed, but breweries and brew pubs are to operate if they also operate a restaurant, either by way of a bona fide eating place on the premises or through the use of a bona fide meal provider. And bona fide meal, this is actually ABC speak, um, right, to so the Alcoholic Beverage Commission, so it actually means something for who are in the business. Um, so brewer, brew pubs, breweries, and bars and pubs must close immediately. But if that brewery or brew pub is a bona fide eating, you know, providing a bona fide meals, then you would be able to continue operations outdoors only. So um, I know that was very, that was really confusing. We are entering this, quite frankly, brave, um, phase of bureaucratic confusion where now we have you know state rules being implemented on a local level i know that it's been very very challenging for folks but please know that the county will continue to try to um, get the message out even though these are state regulations that are being handed down to us and we're hoping to work with small businesses with chambers of commerce to try to explain things and walk folks through them if they have any questions so i am going to go ahead and scroll through um the list of things here we go um, David Rosen asks, children under five, is that recent? We actually have had children under five um, testing positive for the disease for quite some time now, but um, they have typically been asymptomatic. So I wanna be clear that just because they're testing positive, um, they are usually actually identified as a close contact of a confirmed positive. So say their parent or their aunt or uncle test positive, they may actually not be symptomatic and we're actually catching them when they are asymptomatic. So that's good news if the child is obviously not too sick. Um, and it's also good news to know who is ill in the household. Um, not good that they have the disease, but, but good to be um, asymptomatic. Question from uh, Norma Jean, leave the beaches open. You know it's healthier. People need sunshine and beaches for vitamin D. It's lack of vitamin D, which causes illness. Totally appreciate vitamin D. Think that if you can get outside, you should, although wear your sunscreen um, because the sun can also cause, cause skin cancer and you can get vitamin D from food as well, from supplements and things. Um, we have no plans to close down the beaches. That would not be a data-driven decision. We are not seeing transmission for evidence of transmission in outdoor settings in beaches and parks and we have not found it, right? That's one of the reasons that we reopened the parks in phases um, and we have not seen evidence of an uptick or of transmission that was affiliated with outdoor recreation as opposed to you know gatherings, right? So just outdoor recreation within your household is a fairly low risk activity. All right, um, let's see. Anna Joyce, is there anywhere that cases are broken down by zip code? West County covers a lot of territory. Uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, the fifth district is very large. We've got 55 miles of coastline. West County is huge. We do not unfortunately have case, cases broken down by zip code, but as the number of cases increases, I will definitely inquire with our privacy officer um, to see if we can actually share a little bit more detailed data. I think that's an excellent question and I will definitely follow up on that, Anna. So thank you for asking that question. Um, Candace asks, how many of the ICU beds are COVID patients? I do not have that data. Um, that would also be very interesting information to know. You know, I do know that we have um, at least one transfer, not more. The um, patients that have been hospitalized from San Quentin Prison have been sent around the Bay Area. And I do know that we have actually taken in transfers um, from Marin County for that purpose. And they're sort of, you know, being spread around the Bay Area because of the concentration of cases in Marin County and the lack of capacity in their ICU. You know that we also have COVID-19 positives that are local positives who are in the ICU right now, but I don't have 
the breakdown um, for that. All right, I am scrolling down. Um, David asks, Linda, can you talk about hotels versus vacation rentals and if the county will discriminate between the two? That is an excellent question. Um, so right now we are not taking specific action um, as a county. We are actually working in concert with the state. And so it is the state who is establishing the guidelines and hospitality in terms of lodging facilities is not currently on the state's um, mandated closure requirement. So right now there is no differentiation between hotels and vacation rentals and they are not on the current chopping block with respect to potential closures. Um, I do not anticipate those necessarily being treated differently, um, but uh, you know, again, it, everything can change at any point. I will say that Dr. Mace has really focused on targeted specific shutdowns um, so, you know, really looking at what, what industries are, are sort of generating the positives locally, right? And then also can we identify on a business by business um, sort of type of a scenario. So again, looking at a little bit more of a scalpel and less of a blunt instrument. However, the state is handing us a bit of a blunt instrument with the list of closures that I shared earlier. Um, but again, those tend to be higher risk areas where you have lots of people coming together to share a space. When you're talking about vacation rentals, when you're talking about hotels that have individual rooms or certainly individual cabins, um, the risk is lower as you're not seeing the mixing of populations in the same common indoor area. Um, Michael then asks, any discussions of closing hotels or resorts in the coming weeks? I do not have any information on that or any um, sort of inclination that I'm hearing at the state level yet. They are focusing right now on the indoor dine-in restaurants, indoor wineries and tasting rooms, indoor family entertainment centers, movie theaters, zoos, museums, card rooms, and then all brew pubs, breweries, bars, and pubs. So that's kind of the first tranche and hoping that that stabilizes things in the weeks to come. Um, question around, Carrie asked gyms, and I'm assuming, does that mean that there anything happening with gyms? I have not, gyms are not on the list from the state. Um, so I do not think that gyms are slated for closure at this point in time. Annalise asks, can you speak as to why gyms are not on the list? And that is a great question um, because that is also an indoor area where people from different uh, you know, households tend to co-mingle. It is just simply not on the state list and I don't have any more information, but I can certainly ask Dr. Mace and follow up with you. Um, Tracy asks, so do these close tomorrow or three days from tomorrow? That is a great question and that has been a huge point of confusion over the last 24 hours. They will not close tomorrow. Tomorrow starts the three day time window where in the state and the county are working very closely with one another. So it would be three days from tomorrow, um, not tomorrow. So we do have one more weekend with those businesses being open before anticipated closure next week. All right, um, question from Carrie Robinson. Why is a brewery different from outdoor winery? Um, you know, I will be perfectly honest with you. I, I don't see the difference myself. This is a, a state definition definition and I don't understand why we're distinguishing between a brewery as compared to a winery or a tasting room. But at the end of the day, um, the main message here is that if that brewery, and I think a lot of them do in Sonoma County, if it is a bona fide meal provider, then they actually can remain open, right? Just for outdoor service and for takeout service as well. Um, Sharon notes that we still have daily flights coming in from Phoenix. That is true, and I have heard from a number of constituents that they are concerned um, about the increasing case rate in Arizona and the fact that we do continue to have folks coming in from Arizona. Uh, Wendy also asks, will gym ne gyms need to close again? Again, I do not have any information regarding gym closures. That is not on the list that I have. Um, Sharon also asks, why are we having flights from Phoenix and Dallas come into our local airport and community? You know, this is an important conversation, I think, to have with Dr. Mace and uh, with the Board of Supervisors, because ultimately the county actually owns that airport, right? That's a locally owned airport, it is not a private airport. And so we actually do have oversight over what happens at that airport. And there's actually a plan, you know, regarding how many flights and where they should come from. And so I think we should ask that question as a community. And I would be happy to um, inquire with Dr. Mace as to whether she thinks that's a significant source. Because here's the thing. I mean, we know that there are positives out in the community. We know that there are people coming from other counties in that are driving in or that are driving from say LA which has a higher case rate than we do or any of those other counties in California so folks are always going to come into Cali into Sonoma County right we are a beautiful place we do have lodging facilities open right now we know we will have visitors in my opinion you know and what from what I've heard from Dr. Mace what really matters right is how the community is behaving as a whole including visitors but there could also be locals who are positive too right 
but it's more about how does the transmission happen once you're in Sonoma County? Are you being, are you engaging in safe behavior or are you engaging in high risk behavior? How do we minimize those contacts between people as well as the minimizing the duration of contacts and then also putting additional non-pharmaceutical interventions into place such as facial coverings. And so the more that we do that, um, the less it matters in terms of you know, an occasional positive coming into our community. So just, just a few thoughts, but I do think it's still worthy of a conversation. And I know that there have been some other states and other communities that have actually drawn a line in the sand and said, you know, you, you can't come into the state unless you're going to be quarantining. So it's worthy of a conversation. Um, Damien asks, is the public health department tracking the health of children or adults too who have tested positive over time after recovery? Um, that is an excellent question. I do know that we have been doing some um, antibody testing in some of those folks who previously tested positive. I do not know um, whether we are kind of going back and suggesting that folks retest. And I know that's a, a top interest for a lot of folks, you know. Do you actually have those antibodies for a long time, right? Will you be immune? And then also, are you, or is it possible that you might become positive again? Because we've had some reports from that in the news. So that's a great question, and I will follow up on that one, Damien. Thank you for asking. Jennifer asks, so bars, breweries, wine tasting should expect to be shut down in about three days unless they have their own restaurant and serve people outside only. That is correct, but with one asterisk, which is that they don't have to have their own restaurant. They could also have meals that are provided by a bona fide provider. And again, that's an alcoholic beverage commission speak. That's sort of their you know term of art is bona fide meal provider. So um, similar to you know what I think uh, the Rainbow did right, where they partnered up with. Um, Susie Pizza, why can't I remember the name of her pizza shop right there across the street in Guerneville? Um, and you know, they were serving pizza there. That is something that could totally be happening. Um, so you know, you could still continue to serve with a bona fide meal producer, but uh, um, provider, but outdoors only. So no indoors. Scrolling down, um, Marisol asks, is it frozen? And I don't know what that was referring to. Um, and I apologize for not knowing, or maybe that was a conversation. Um, in there with uh, somebody else. Did Oh, did the broadcast freeze? I apologize if my internet is not working well. Um, Marissa asks, I work at the casino. Will they stay open? Um, that is a, a great question and it would depend on whether they are a bona fide meal provider um, or if they can actually have a you know, bona fide meal provider provide food on site. So, and I, I believe that they, and I know, I mean, I know they serve meals, but this is kind of a specific classification with the state. So you need to check in um, with the owners there just to confirm. All right, um, just, let's see. Question, question from JC, will there be mandatory testing when schools start back up? That's a great question. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that one. You know, right now what I've been hearing with, respecting to, with respect to schools is more regarding social distancing, mandated facial coverings, um, maximum, you know, sizes of classrooms. Those are the conversations that I have heard with respect to the guidelines that have been issued by the Sonoma County Office of Education and also from various school districts. Um, I have not heard about mandatory testing requirements. I do know that there's a lot of, of you know, research and development right now going on around what happens, you know, what will happen if it, and when a child tests positive, what will and when a teacher tests positive, right? Um, then do we need to have, you know, everybody, the entire classroom go into quarantine and then I'd be tested before they come back to school. So that's where I think you might see mandatory testing come in is if there is a known exposure. All right, um, Cindy asks, is testing going to be increased? It's taking a week to get an appointment and about six days for results. Um, this has been very frustrating and I addressed this last week, I believe as well. Um, so unfortunately we are seeing a huge backlog in the OptumServe testing. And my understanding is that's coming from a statewide backlog um, and actually because apparently OptumServe, I believe sends their tests uh, to Quest and they are actually experiencing a shortage of testing kits. So ironically, we're right back to where we were, you know, when we were back in March and we, we didn't have enough testing kits and we didn't have enough testing. Unfortunately, there was once again a national shortage of testing kits. And so everything has slowed down as a result of that. It's extremely frustrating at the, um, you know, on the public health perspective to not get test results in, you know, right away. The problem is, is that if you don't get those test results right away, right, you could have someone who doesn't know that they're positive and so they are acting like a normal person, right? Even though they've been recommended to stay home, even though they've been told to stay home, but they've been um, you know, out in the community potentially spreading that disease for a week to 10 days before we have the positive. 
otherwise. And then of course, it's only when we get the positive on the public health team that we can get our contact tracers mobilized to then start going and talking to the person that that, you know, positive con that positive um, patient was in contact with. So it really slows down the whole process, which is extremely frustrating. So we need to continue advocating at a state and federal level to ensure that we have an adequate number of testing kits to ensure that we have that fast turnaround time. And I've also heard frustration around our long folks, you know, not being able to get that testing. Do you remember that it's not just OptumServe, right? You can also go through your healthcare provider. So there are a number of ways of achieving a test. You can always reach out to your doctor um, first and see if you can get a test through your physician, through your healthcare provider. And then you can also go the OptumServe route. So there are a few different options. Tracy asks, when will Dr. Mace give some concrete information on schools opening? Districts are struggling making plans because of possible defunding from the state if they full, choose a full distance learning start. Unless she specifically orders schools not to open, then there is a money issue, not a health issue. Um, that is a very, you know, I wonder if that's coming from the, the federal threats um, regarding not opening schools. I have not heard that at a state level, but I would love to learn more. And if there's anyone who, you know, if you're a parent or if you're a teacher or if you're on a school board and you're really struggling to get that information, I would happily um, ensure that, you know, Dr. Mace is, is in coordination with all of our superintendents and school board members. I know that she has been working with Dr. Harrington, who's a superintendent of the Sonoma County um, Office of Education. But if there's any missing pieces in terms of communication, I would be more than happy to facilitate those kinds of meetings. Let's see, James suggests quarantine people who come from other areas. That is what more successful areas did. Um, yes, and that has been very successful, especially in areas um, that are geographically bounded, such as islands, right, where they actually were able to quarantine everyone coming in and then really um, hold down the, uh, the case rate locally. Let's see, um, scrolling down. David asks, would you please ask people who visit Armstrong Woods to please wear a mask? I am there multiple times a week and so many people are still not wearing them and many of them are likely local. Um, this is a great point and actually Jen Wirtz called into the Board of Supervisors meeting today during our COVID-19 update and she actually had a really great suggestion which is, you know, why don't we through regional parks, which is I recognize that Armstrong Woods is not a regional park, but I'm hoping that maybe if we bought a bunch of masks through regional parks that we could share them with our state parks partners, right? Maybe work with uh, stewards of the coast and redwoods. But Jen's idea was for regional parks to actually buy a whole bunch of masks. And then if someone is not wearing a mask in a regional park to actually go up and give them a mask and say either you can take this mask or you can leave the park now. And I think that we could take a similar approach to Armstrong Woods. I do want to acknowledge that, you know, I, I go out and I walk through uh, Forestville. We've been doing it every night for a couple of weeks now. And um, there's kind of a, you know, an unwritten protocol, right? You don't wear your mask until you're, you know, maybe with you see someone approaching right then you either put your mask on or some people don't bring their mask and they just simply cross the street because it's not a very highly trafficked area so we want to make sure that we are being um you know sympathetic that if someone is not any near, near anyone else they don't need to bring a mask but if they are in areas you know like trails where they are passing other people they absolutely should be wearing a mask and i, I think it's really fundamentally a sign of respect for other people because you're not doing it for yourself you're doing it for everyone else so i think it's very important that everyone follows the same rule in order to keep their neighbors and other folks who are at the park safe. So anyways, I'll be following up with Burt Whitaker. He was on vacation and I wasn't sure if he was back, so I didn't want to text him a day, but I'm going to send him an email tonight and ask about those masks. And if we do get them through regional parks, I would love to share them with state parks and um, maybe partner with Stewards of the Coast and Redwoods. All right. Michael O'Connell asks, will hotels have to go to outdoor seating in room dining as well. So if a hotel does have a dining facility that would fall in the same category as a restaurant, it would still need to be shifted outside with respect to food service. Um, so again, we are trying to shift food service outdoors, which is a lower risk um, location for food service as compared to indoor areas. Cynthia asks, are they going to be shutting down dental offices? I have not heard of anything um, with respect to dental office shutdown. So there has been no signal from the state or from our public health officer regarding shutting down dental offices. Um, Melly Mel asks, will the mall food court shut down? Um, that is a really good question. So I would have to ask Dr. Mace and County Council to get a firm answer on that one. Um, but my understanding would be that if they were providing food for takeout service that was not to be for indoor dining, that they would be allowed to operate just to be able to be picked up, assuming that the mall is still allowed um, to be open. So that's a great question for County Council and I'll, I'll work on getting a firm answer, but my, my gut instinct would say that they could provide food, you just couldn't actually eat it indoors. 
All right, um, let's see. Alan asks, um, hi Linda, have you spoken with a sheriff or any of his representatives regarding ex-deputy Charles Blount or David Ward last Thanksgiving? Everything on the video meets the criteria of section 187 of the California Penal Code, um, but he has been arrested. You know, I have watched that video um, and I found it extraordinarily troubling. Um, that was a very, very difficult video to watch. And I have not spoken with the sheriff um, about that one in particular. And I have not spoken with the district attorney about that either. Um, but, uh, you know, I, it's something that very much needs to be addressed. And um, unfortunately, I, I can't say too much about it because it is a subject of litigation um, with the county. But I, it is, um, it's something that I think really to me shows the need for transparent processes, right? We need to have citizens oversight of law enforcement. And we also really need to make sure that people have access to body worn camera footage, right? So they can see with their own eyes what happened. Um, and so, you know, there's a little bit of a slippery slope around this. I know that some videos have not been posted, some have, and that it ultimately is, you know, left to make those determinations. And I really fundamentally believe in transparency and that we all need to be able to have access to those videos and also that we all need to have a role in civilian oversight over law enforcement. And that is really, I think, a positive proactive way of driving positive policy changes around use of force, around interactions with people who may be struggling with mental illness, around our unsheltered population. There are so many issues right now and of course around racial injustice. Um, and so I, I really think that we all need to get engaged, that we need to have these conversations. And I, I'm glad that I have the opportunity to serve on the IOLERO ad hoc, um, which will be getting going very soon and having some public hearings and some opportunities to hear from the community about what they might like to see of enhanced law enforcement oversight. All right, um, Marisol asks, what can we do to ensure it's mandated that masks and face coverings are worn at all businesses? This is a great question. Um, so it is currently mandated, right, for facial coverings to be worn in businesses. And um, we actually had a conversation at the Board of Supervisors today regarding how we can step up enforcement of that. So can we actually create a civil penalty and fine, right, that could then allow park rangers, uh, code enforcement officers, and um, you know, environmental health specialists, even people with the Ag Commissioner to actually go ahead and implement those fines. We also talked about the ability to create a hotline for employees to be able to report concerning work conditions. Because we've heard from a number of employees that they feel that, you know, maybe social distancing isn't being taken seriously enough. Maybe employees, are, sorry, maybe clients are coming in to the place of business and not wearing facial coverings and they're concerned about lack of enforcement. So we are working to step up enforcement health order and we're also working to set up education um, because again you know it's confusing right now some counties are doing you know one thing other counties are doing another some were kind of resisting the state saying that you need to wear facial coverings and they were trying to push it as far as they can to make you know make it not quite mandatory but just recommended and and so there's not a huge consistency across the state right now in some you know areas they're already shut down we're just on the of being you know about to shut down here in Sonoma County and so we also want to make sure that we're not just punishing people, right? That we're also just trying to educate them and get the word out in ways um, that are accessible. Damien says, just to clarify, I was asking more about secondary effects of the virus. For example, someone who has recovered than having blood clots or neurological issues. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying um, that question. And that is definitely something that I can follow up on. I believe that was a question relating to um, sort of folks who are coming back um, with, um, you know, uh, were they being retested later? So... All right, Annalise has a question. Thanks for addressing the backlog of testing results since you mentioned that and how it impacts contact tracing. Um, it is really concerning and you are the only one I hear talking about it. Thank you. Um, you're welcome and I, I, I hope that we can all talk about this and that we can address this on a state and a federal level because if we don't get those positive results in real time, we cannot effectively wrap our arms around the virus, right? Because contact tracing is really the thing that then gets those people who are positive out of the community where they stop spreading the disease, right? We get them isolated. And I also want you all to know that we are continuing to work on replacement locations for our, our alternate care site at Sonoma State University, which is having to wind down. Um, so we we're looking at a number of different locations, not only for our unsheltered residents who are at high risk of COVID-19 complications. Um, so these are at risk, previously homeless residents. Some of them are for cancer treatment. Some of them are very elderly. Um, we're trying to make sure that they aren't just kicked back out on the street, that they have a safe place to go and to be safe. And then the other main sort of 
function that the alternate care site was fulfilling was that quarantine purpose, right? So if you have someone say who lives within their family member and they just, um, you know, experienced symptoms or they had a known exposure and they want to make sure that they're not then sharing space with that family member, this provides them with free of charge, a location where they can go and be distant away from their family. So very, very critical. Jessica Wolf asks, for school opening, will funding be available for masks and cleaning supplies? I would hate to see teachers foot the bill. This is an excellent question, and this is one where we really need to put pressure on the state. Unfortunately, you know, the state previously was talking about really draconian cuts to our school system. They backed off on that, but we knew, do need to continue to fight for additional funding. Um, you know, we are staring down a just absolutely devastating budget shortfall at the county level, and we are really trying to fight for that second round of funding from the federal government. If we can, that will enable us to make more targets investments in the community and to actually restart we were you know early on in the pandemic we just went all out at, at the county of Sonoma with respect to securing you know masks and gowns and all kinds of PPE to make sure that we had local stockpiles it was extremely expensive it cost millions of dollars um, and so you know we're not able to keep that effort sustained over the long haul but if the federal government, you know, where they can print money, we can't do that locally, we get in trouble when we try, um, you know, that's where we really need to look for having some funding resources to be able to keep up those kinds of efforts. And I would love to partner with the school system. I would love to partner with all of our small businesses to provide them with the PPE that they need. Um, but we do need to have more revenue streams in order to do that. All right. Um, let's see. Any more questions? I'm just scrolling down here. Do, do, do. Two positive cases at In and Out in Roanoke Park. One um, confirmed on Rancho Varsity football team. Is the county looking into these? I cannot comment on specific cases. Um, I am often apprised of specific cases in my district just because I know people. But what I always do is I immediately refer them to DHS. HIPAA, you know, issues involved with specific locations or specific people. You know, you have to be really sensitive about their health information. Um, but, you know, I will say that the vast majority of times when I pass on information, the Department of Health Services is already on it. They're already doing the contact tracing. They already have the machine mobilized. So um, with that, it looks like it's nine o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap that up. If there are any questions that are not, um, we're not, I didn't get to answer. I apologize, but I will go through and try to type out some answers. And I will also follow up on those questions that I didn't have the answers to. So thank you very much for joining me tonight. And I hope that you are staying safe. You are staying healthy and be well. Have a good night.